Uh, thank you for all for coming, um, and thank you, David, for his kind invitation. Tonight I'm going to be talking about a brief history of human migration, which um, will take us all the way from a, a story starting two million years ago uh, up to the present day, uh, which is inevitably, therefore, a history of human evolution as well, because throughout that period, humans evolved. And then because this is the Libertarian Alliance, I will then um, talk a bit about how this history of human migration uh, influences or should influence our opinions about liberty and what it means for the prospects for liberty, uh, so far as we enjoy them in this country, and also what it means for libertarianism as an ideology. Um, and I'm going to argue that perhaps there are some things about migration, some of the challenges that migration presents that libertarianism isn't able to uh, meet fully. So I'm going to talk about it for about half an hour, and then uh, under David's direction, I'll take some questions. So the story of human migration starts uh, two million years ago uh, with the emergence of humans. As an anatom anatomically modern humans uh, appeared about two million years ago. But then they only left Africa about 200,000 years ago, uh, moving throughout the world, uh, ultimately to Asia and then to America. Um, and in tandem with this move throughout the world, uh, we have the evolution of uh, evolution of humans doesn't uh, doesn't stop; it continues. And as humans move throughout the world, they continue to change and to adapt to their environment. One of the ways in which they change is uh, in brain size. So. Starting two million years ago, when humans split off from chimpanzees, human brain size uh, gradually starts to expand and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, but, of course, that's just one of the ways in which humans changed uh, throughout this period. They adapted to their environments as they moved into new environments. Uh, they adapted, and because those environments were different, they developed all sorts of different adaptations. For example, people who lived in tropical areas tended to have evolved to be tall and lean to lose heat, and people who lived in Arctic areas and mountain, mountainous areas tended to be short and wide to conserve heat. People who lived high up would tend to uh, evolve to adapt to live in a thin air environment. So in Tibet, people uh, evolved uh, one way. In Ethiopia, they evolved another way. In the Andes, another way. So there are various adaptations to altitude. Um, having more blood cells, having larger lungs. Uh, in pale, in, sorry, in dim climates like England, people evolved to have pale skin so that they could more easily uh, photosynthesize, vis photosynthesize vitamin D. Uh, Eskimos evolved to eat uh, fatty food. They evolved to have the enzymes they need to do that. Um, so there's a whole variety of adaptations to local environments that explain why people uh, today are quite different in different areas around the world. As humans moved around the world, this led to conflict because there were other animals already there. So first I'm going to talk about Homo sapiens, humans, uh, in conflict with other animals. Then I'm going to move on to talking about Homo sapiens in conflict with other types of humans like the Neanderthals and uh, the Denisovans. And finally, uh, what will take up the bulk of uh, my talk is uh, human conflict between humans and other humans. Most predators are specialised predators, so they co-evolve with their prey, and they're, they're beautifully designed, leopards are beautifully designed to chase gazelles, gazelles are beautifully designed to escape from leopards, um, and they can't quickly evolve, because evolution is a slow process, they can't evolve overwhelming superiority very quickly, and if they did, then they would tend to drive their prey to extinction, and then they would go extinct themselves, and this happens occasionally. Um, but it doesn't happen very often. In fact, generally when it happens, it's because some predator has been newly introduced to the environment. Uh, unspecialized predators don't tend to do very well. So bears, omnivores, aren't an enormously successful um, animal. Uh, Neanderthals, uh, who were, were not our ancestors but were a separate branch of the human evolutionary tree, uh, didn't wipe out any species as far as we know, whereas humans are the ultimate predator. Humans, uh, we didn't used to be early in our evolutionary history. We had to hide up trees to escape from 
uh, people who want for, from animals who wanted to eat us. But human intelligence allows us to arrive in a new place, eat everything that's there, wipe out a species, and then not go extinct because we're able to uh, we're intelligent. We're able to uh, move on and wipe out other species, or ideally not. Um, our intelligence allows us to reach new areas because we have we could build boats, we could build rafts, we could make clothes to live in colder countries. Um, and so humans are the ultimate predator because we can prey on so many different animals. We're, we're omnivores. And so you see, as humans migrated around the world, that whenever humans turn up, species go extinct. For example, dodos, famous example. Mammoths were finished off by humans. Giant tortoises we see go extinct different times around the world, pretty much exactly when humans show up, because humans were the only animals who were able to, um, to prey on giant tortoises, because we had the tools that could get through their shells. Uh, we had the tools which animals lacked, like wooden spears. And today, giant tortoises only, survive, only survived in the Galapagos uh, just. And when humans leave an area, which doesn't happen very often, then animals can suddenly flourish again. So in the shadow of the Berlin Wall, you've got wild rabbits. And in the North Korean demilitarized zone, you now get black bears returning. Um, and in, Af in parts of Africa, sleeping sickness did create virtually human-free zones where wildlife was able to flourish. A little later on, about 45,000 years ago, uh, humans and Neanderthals met. And because they occupied the same evolutionary niche, eating the same sort of prey and animal and, and plants, um, competing for the same resources in a Malthusian world where they weren't able to produce new resources as we are now. Uh, Neanderthals went extinct pretty quickly afterwards, about 4,000 years later. Um, although there was some inbreeding between humans and Neanderthals, uh, and even today we now have, uh, most of us have um, some uh, Neanderthal genes which puts lie to the, the naive definition of a species. People say that a species is two animals are of a different species if they can't interbreed, but actually that's not quite true. And of course in the plant kingdom it's not true at all because two different species of plants can produce hybrids. Humans were able to outcompete Neanderthals because they were more intelligent. Uh, although, interestingly, Neanderthals did have slightly larger brains, um, but a larger brain doesn't just, it isn't, inevitably going to make you more intelligent. For example, sperm whales have very large brains, but humans are more intelligent. So it's not just brain size, which shot up over human evolution, but also brain complexity and brain structure. And as humans moved around the world, some systems of uh, living were more successful than others. The classic example is farmers versus foragers. So foragers, or hunter-gatherers, were the original humans, and agriculture was discovered and was made possible by the uh, evolution and the breeding of certain plants, um, certain grasses, i.e. wheat nowadays, maize. Um, and because hunters, hunter-gatherers, can't use the same territory as uh, farmers, when they clash, generally the farmers win uh, and the hunter-gatherers get driven to extinction or close to it, which is what happened in North America when white people turned up 500 years ago and the Native Americans didn't do very well out of it. Disease obviously played a role as well. So in a zero-sum game, they, can't, they cannot coexist uh, or cannot coexist easily, so one of them wins and the other, the other evolutionary branch of the tree dies out. Interestingly, this is purely about fitness because farmers, uh, by most accounts, back in the day, had worse lifestyles than um, hunter-gatherers. Apparently, being hun apart from, of course, disease and lack of, of modern technology, uh, modern medicine, um, people generally preferred being hunter-gatherers. Ben Franklin, in his autobiography, talks about how when white people would go to live with the Red Indians, uh, they loved it and would try and stay, almost without exception. And when Red Indians would come and live in civilization, they hated it, almost without exception, and would always try to go back because living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and riding horses was great fun, um, and being a farmer wasn't. But they were out-competed, and with, the, with them, uh, political systems 
tag along with humans. And so if one group of, uh, the point is that if one group of humans have a, one system of uh, living or a politics of farming and everything that goes with that culturally, uh, the, uh, the, some, this is a mechanism by which political systems can outcompete others. Um, one way, of course, is the battle of ideas, and the other way is what we've just heard about, the battle of, of people. And there are many examples throughout history of as people move to, as one group of people move to a new area, if it's already inhabited, you get um, conflict, and generally um, one, one group will die out. Uh, for example, uh, the Dorset people replaced by the India, in, Inuit, uh, the Eskimos, um, driven extinct only about 600, 700 years ago. Um, the Aztecs conquered by the Spanish, um, and their population declined something like 80% in only 60 years, um, aided, of course, by the diseases that the Spanish brought with them, like smallpox and typhus. Although it works both ways, actually, because uh, syphilis was a new world disease which wasn't uh, known of in Europe until it was brought over the Atlantic uh, 500 years ago. Uh, the Inca were conquered by the Spanish. The Aryans conquered northern Indi India, replacing the Indus Valley civilization. That was 1500 BC. China has twice been conquered by people from the north, uh, but never from the south. Uh, and of course, North America was conquered by Europeans, um, and South America uh, by um, Southern Europeans. And this came with a, an ideology to back it up. Um, the remaining Native Americans, there are still Native Americans around, but they have substantial inbreeding. Uh, they're largely uh, inherited most of their genome is inherited from white settlers rather than from the original Native Americans. Um, America was settled by people from, mostly by people from the British Isles, also from Germany a bit later. Uh, there's a marvelous book called Albion Seed about how different people from different parts of the British Isles populated different parts of America, of North America, and how the cultural differences persist even to this day. Um, Texas is an interesting example of uh, northern Europeans, mostly from the British Isles, uh, competing with um, the Spanish occupants of Mexico for control of, of uh, Texas. Originally, Texas was part of Mexico um, and was populated by the descendants of Spaniards, um, but it then was gradually had, had an inward migration from the north of white people, uh, who, and then eventually it became overwhelming, the country became independent, then it joined the United States, and now the process perhaps is is going in the other direction, um, and uh, the Hispanic population and the Mexican population moving northwards because the white people in Texas aren't breeding as much. Um, yeah, so potentially that that process will reverse. So that's a that's a potted evolutionary history of human migration, which takes us roughly up to the present day. Um, I'll now try and draw out some lessons from this. Uh, for libertarians, the most interesting thing about historical human migration is that there was no state control. Nowadays, migration uh, across international borders is highly regulated, uh, mostly in most countries, give or take. Um, but historically, the state simply wasn't able to uh, control the process. Um, it did have a hand in the process. Um, for example, when uh, the uh, various British governments gave their blessing to the population of the Americas by Brits. Um, but it, there was the point is, in that case, there was no American state at the time to, be, to even be capable of rejecting the migrants. Um, it was purely a matter of individual uh, Native American tribes. Um, whereas now, of course, um, there's a lot of state control of immigration. I'll come on to that in just a second. Uh, Another lesson about historical human migration is that uh, ethnic diversity is quite an unusual result. Um, it's much more common nowadays, but throughout history, generally uh, replacement uh, and um, extinction were much more common. Um, population replacement was more common, although you did also get marriage between tribal bands if you go a lot further back in time, without, if we're talking sort of tens of thousands of years ago rather than hundreds of years ago. Uh, and another lesson about uh, immigration is that in modern societies, until recently, immigration levels were extremely low. And this led to almost total uh, assimilation. 
So in Britain, for example, um, immigration until the 50s was measured in the thousands a year. Um, some years, hundreds. Very, very few compared to modern levels. Um, and they tended to be from countries that were nearby because traveling around the world wasn't possible, wasn't easy uh, in large numbers, whereas traveling just across the English Channel uh, was. So you see the sorts of immigrants to Britain over the last two, three hundred years uh, were people like the Huguenots from France or the poor Palatines from Germany. Uh, whereas nowadays uh, migration has been made much easier by the relative cheapness of international travel. Um, and you can easily move not only countries, but you can move across the world very quickly. Uh, and so levels of immigration nowadays are, are historically unprecedented. Um, in the 50s, migration to Britain was less than 50,000 a year, but now it's more like 500 or 600,000 a year, um, em immigration that is, uh, and also emigration of about 300,000 a year. Um, although I do find the concept of a measure of net immigration a rather strange one because it assumes that, uh, that the people are the same and that the, 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 the phenomenon of immigration and the phenomenon of emigration are purely two sides of the same coin, although the picture is in reality slightly more complex than that. Um, and as I said earlier, there's a lot more state control of immigration. Uh, in the case of Britain, um, some of it's subsidised and some of it's banned. So on the one hand, we have European navies subsidising immigration by rescuing people from the waters of the Mediterranean um, and not taking them back to their, their, their country of departure, but taking them to the, their intended destination. Um, and we also have subsidy of immigration through the welfare state. But on the other hand, uh, immigration is taxed in some ways. So uh, there are very large fees uh, to pay to the British government for um, legal migration. So I would like to argue that though there are, there are some great differences between modern migration and historical migration, there are also great similarities because from an evolutionary perspective, uh, it's purely a matter of individual people and families trying to better their own lives and um, have as many children as possible. And the ones who do have as many children as possible uh, will tend to flourish because the future belongs to people who share. And people who don't will tend to uh, die out or stay where they are. So if you, the point is that if you can occupy more territory or if you can spread your family over a great, greater part of the world's territory, then you're likely to have more children and your genes are more likely to flourish. So I would argue that historical migration and modern migration should, see, should both be seen as part of the grand evolutionary story. Um, now I'd like to talk briefly about um, some of the consequences of migration in the modern world. Um, and then I'll uh, move on to uh, the consequences for liberty of modern migration. So there are two um, key researchers about um, modern migration. One is Robert Putnam, and the other is William Easterly. Now Putnam has done... Um, work recently on the consequences of ethnic diversity and his findings are that more ethnic diversity leads to less social trust both within uh, and without ethnic groups, um, less altruism, less community cooperation, less social so solidarity and less social capital. Um, William Easterly uh, has done research on what he calls ethnic fractionalization um, and he finds that as long as um, government institutions are sufficiently bad, as he puts it, then uh, an ethnic mix leads to, quote, low schooling, political instability, undeveloped financial systems, distorted foreign exchange markets, high government deficits, and insufficient infrastructure. So from a liberal point of view, that's not a good thing. But his findings, he's keen to stress, don't apply to countries with institutions that are strong enough to resist these effects. Um, so clearly, the concept of, of diversity um, is, is, a, is actually a, a ragbag of a whole, different, a whole load of different uh, phenomena. So diversity of um, some things is good and some things is not bad, is not good. So diversity of intelligence is not a good thing. We want everyone to be intelligent. Uh, diversity of institutional quality 
is not a good thing because we want everyone, we want all countries to have good institutions. And uh, diversity of religion, well, if you asked a Christian, they'd probably say that they wanted everyone to be Christian. And if you wanted a Muslim, they'd probably say that, that they wanted everyone to be a Muslim. Um, finally, I'll talk a bit about uh, the compatibility of migration with uh, a libertarian society um, and libertarianism. I think one of the problems with libertarianism is that it there are some things that it's not able to um, respond effectively to. I know I know that some people argue that it, it is in theory able to, but well, we'll be able to talk about this afterwards. But for example, um, war. So pacifism, to talk in evolutionary terms, is not an evolutionary stable strategy. So to respond to war, you have to be able to um, to cooperate in a large group and repel the invasion. And I think that orthodox portrayals of a future libertarian society are perhaps not able to do this. Um, there's an essay by uh, Martin Van Creveld where he talks about war and migration, and, and uh, he, it's, the essay is called War and Migration, and he argues that throughout history, uh, migration often leads to conflict and to uh, war. And as I understand it, orthodox libertarianism uh, is all in favour of totally free migration and therefore potentially is going to uh, be hoist by its own petard by encouraging the prob increasing the probability of war. Uh, another, wa another way in which I think um, libertarianism and uh, free migration falls down, uh, or uh, slightly, somewhat contradictory, is um, that humans are different. And some libertarians, like von Mises, argued uh, he was a humanist, and he thought that humans were fundamentally different from animals. But, as we've seen, um, but of course that's, that's not true. The point is that humans are, are animals, um, and like uh, some animals are, well, I'll put it this way. To defend yourself from a wild tiger, you can either uh, build a wall or put the tiger in a cage or um, or shoot it and to defend yourself against humans that aren't you're, you're not able to cooperate with um, you have similar um, similar possible responses uh, I would uh, the way I'd put it or describe it would be to say that a free society is only possible with people who have evolved for it. Um, and a society can only be as complex as the people in it are intelligent. So with some humans, you're able to make complex social arrangements. But with other humans, you can only make simpler agreements. Uh, in fact, there's a, an interesting paper by Frost and Harpending that came out last year, where they argued that the European legacy of capital punishment, uh, which, as they say, um, led to the execution of between half and a percent of half of a percent and one percent of all men every generation led to uh, modern Europeans being less violent than they would have been otherwise and so the idea that you can uh, bring in people who haven't had a legacy of living in a who haven't had ancestors who've lived in an area with a strong state uh, you're going to increase the level of violence in your state um, and so free migration is not um, necessarily a good thing. We know that violence is partly genetic um, because, of course, all uh, human traits are partly genetic. Um, there's recently been some talk about particular individual genes which are starting to be identified, like the so-called warrior gene. Finally, um, I'd like to talk about uh, economic development, um, which is, again, a, a consequence of Economic development in different countries is a consequence of humans being different in different countries. There's a bunch of papers that have come out recently um, saying that, for example, quote, economic development is affected by traits that have been transmitted across generations in the very long run. Uh, quote, a um, better predictor of current inequality in a country is the variance of the early development history of the country's inhabitants with ethnic groups originating in regions having longer histories of agriculture and organized states tending to be at the upper end of a country's income distribution. 
quote, migration has played a significant part in shaping current economic performance. Um, quote, inherited trust of descendants of uh, US immigrants is significantly influenced by the country of their origin of their forebears. Um, and uh, so again, I think it would be uh, rash to adopt the libertarian uh, goal of free migration um, given its likely consequences for uh, political and economic development. So in, in conclusion, uh, and then I'll take questions, uh, modern migration should be seen as a process which has been going on for tens of thousands of years. Um, it, is, uh, it is a disruptive process. It is change, involves change, um, and potentially disruption to food chains, uh, to local equality, sorry, to local ecology, and then in the modern day, uh, changes to society. Um, it is possible, I would observe, to restrict immigration. We see this in uh, Japan, Israel, Australia, and Hungary. Um, and I would, I would leave you with two observations. One, uh, sorry, one observation and one and two quotes. Uh, one observation is. Is it possible to have temporary immigration? There are countries like Dubai uh, and Singapore who um, have guest worker programs where people can come in and work. Uh, and then um, Germany, Germany, mm -hmm. yes, Germany has a, has had a famous one going on for several decades. In Turkey, yeah. um, but is it possible? Does it actually work? Um, is it possible without uh, the temporary migrants having gaining political power? Uh, or indeed staying indefinitely, or their children. Um, and finally, I would like to leave you with uh, two, I thought, amusingly contradictory quotes. Uh, sorry, one quote. Uh, two contradictory observations about Viktor Orban from Hungary, one of the countries I just mentioned who are uh, making a stab at restricting immigration. Um, he said, mass migration is like a slow and steady current of water which wash washes away the shore. It appears in the guise of humanitarian action but its true nature is the occupation of territory. Their gain in territory is our loss of territory. But the funny thing is that while Viktor Orban opposes immigration to Hungary, he's very in favor of immigration from Hungary, uh, which is uh, exactly what you'd expect from an evolutionary perspective. And with that, uh, I would like, under the direction of David, to oh, take your questions. Thank you very much indeed, Hugo. Very good critical paper. Thank you. That's a good criticism of libertarianism. Is there any defenders? Yeah, I would defend the libertarianism <laughs> against the idea that uh, migration is, is essentially disproves libertarianism. That's what sort I of take away from what you, what you say. Um, I think it's uh, it's completely overlooking that we, we don't live in a in a world anymore where you have to basically uh, gather and hunt whatever nature gives you. We live in a capitalist society where we uh, produce a lot and, and the f fundamental principle of that is to cooperation with, with people across all borders and, 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 and cultures. And uh, this process guides people also very much towards where they migrate. They're not migrating because they, they want to spread their genes there or whatever. They're migrating mostly because there are jobs there to be done and uh, they are willing to do these jobs and, 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 and better their lives. So this is a completely different environment from, from, uh, from a, a historical or ancient um, setup in, in which, in which you know, families or tribes are moving around and basically just competing over whatever was there without producing any, any, anything. And um, I think if, if you're really going down that route of, of restricting immigration, you, you're basically um, killing liberalism because uh, you, you're supporting the most liberal institution of all, which is, is the state, which is the only institution that really can effectively politically, after from a political ideology here, uh, restrict uh, the free, free movement of people. And uh, the best regulation of free, free movement is the market, not, not the state. Uh, and the market is regulating uh, a lot of, of free movement. The reason why I don't live in Mayfair is not because I don't like it there. I would like to live there. It's just <coughs> fucking expensive there because everyone wants to live there. And um, that's, that's the free market regulating who can, who can live uh, where. And, uh, I think that works brilliantly. Well, uh, as an aside, I'd first note that, of course, 
people don't consciously um, try to spread their genes uh, in the in in general. Uh, there's a, a, a phrase. What you mean. There's a phrase which sums this up um, to say that people are adaptation executors rather than uh, fitness maximizers. So they don't you don't wake up every morning thinking I'm going to try and spread my genes, but people tend to uh, to do things. Uh, Tend to do things um, that will spread their genes, and if they don't, then they then they're less genetically successful. Um, but so you're, to, to address your point, you were saying that in the modern world we don't live in a Malthusian struggle for resources where one person's loss is another person's gain, and that there are gains from cooperation and trade. Uh, I think the and this is of course absolutely true. Uh, there are two ways in which I could address that. One is um, that. In some, way, in, in some respects, we do uh, live in a Malthusian world in the short term. So, and the short term does... You can't just ignore the short term. So, for example, natural resources like oil, um, the more people there are, uh, the, more, uh, the more expensive it is, uh, and the lower people's uh, living standards are in that respect. Um, although that, that point is, of course, not directly related to immigration because oil moves around the world. Um, but this is known as the pecuniary externality. Uh, but more, more to the point, um, immigration does have or can have externalities. Um, and this is what I think the, the argument that the market um, can regulate immigration in every way, I think that's how it falls down. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Homeless people uh, and beggars, uh, not quite the same thing, but uh, roughly the same thing, um, tend to move to cities because it's much better to be a homeless person in a city than it is in a uh, in the countryside. Um, and I think it would be pretty fair to argue that this is uh, there are no gains from trade and cooperation to be had from increasing the number of homeless people in your country uh, or in your city. Uh, and the point is that the same argument applies, that there are some countries in which it's better to be homeless um, or indeed other forms of parasitical uh, living off other people and not, not no gains from trade, no uh, net production. Um, so there are some forms, I hope you'd concede, of immigration that uh, where the, the gains from trade argument doesn't apply. Uh, and another way, of course, another form of externality is crime. Um, if you have a, a foreign criminal, you can lock them up in your own prison or you could ideally send them back to their own country to be locked up and paid for by uh, the, their originating country's um, justice system. Well, it's not their country. Um, oh, that's a, that's a philosophical point. But, no, it's, it's uh, a very practical point. He doesn't own the country. No, he doesn't own the country, but the, the point is that... Um, Speaking from our country's point of view, clearly it's not a not an advantage to have immigration by professional criminals. Well, it's, it's, and it's therefore an advantage to not have criminals. Full stop. Agreed. Here, Agreed. Here, it could be useful. But the point is, therefore, that a discriminating um, immigration policy, which vets immigrants, I'm not talking about banning immigration. I'm talking about not having free immigration. There's a great spectrum between no immigration and free immigration, and. Uh, and there, there are clearly gains uh, to be had from um, choosing between immigrants, and the, therefore this, only the state, well, and, and the victims of crime, for example. Yeah, of course we want to we want to get criminals. We want to get criminals, domestic or or, or, or foreign. Yes. It does it doesn't matter. But when you, but if when you, you can say well, there are their benefits, benefits for whom? That's that's always the question in, in politics. A, a, a politician, a state, always makes regulations in favor of one group and against another. Politics really is a zero-sum game, while the market isn't. And that, that also applies to, to immigration. If, if, uh, the, the whole anti-immigration argument is basically based on special interests. Some people don't like these people here because they, they have to compete with these new immigrants. And that's why they... they well, that's, the, that's one argument, but of course I've given well, that's, other that's, arguments. That's one of the major arguments. The other is, is simply xenophobia. That, that is simply the idea that uh, I don't like these people and the state should, should, should get rid of them. That's a completely anti-freedom argument. Because sure, but of course as a, those are two arguments, but I have, there are other arguments as I've presented today. Although, of course, you, are, you may not be convinced by them. No, no, um, no. 
pub. Um, as a libertarian, I suppose one ought to stress that freedom of association means also freedom of disassociation. Yes. Which means not on this road, not in this area, uh, not without the permission of the local uh, residents. So move along. Now, it could be argued that uh, it would pay um, a port to accept people and then put them on the road to somewhere else. But if the road to somewhere else was impassable because they were not acceptable, um, well, then the ports were not bringing these people in because they were. Yeah. Because people would find out it's not worth going there, they wouldn't travel, they wouldn't arrive, they wouldn't pay. So why can't um, a mere disassociation mean there are lots of countries in the world and they have little countries elsewhere in the world where people gather, but they're not, they are distinct from the remainder of the country. So in other words, what binds the whole lot together is economic exchange and production, but within that, there are pockets of a little Italy, a little France, a little this, a little that. Now, once people are there and their children are raised, they might speak the local language, they might wish to leave. But at that point, I should have thought, to those who object to that difference and strangeness, yeah. aliens, they would cease to be alien at that point. They would simply move out of their, their, little, their little land, little Italy, little France, and become just normal folk. Would it be fair to characterise the first half of your argument as a private property oh, yeah. argument? Um, well, in respect to that, I have one one criticism and one observation. The criticism is that um, you gave an example of a, a port that would be paid by migrants to take them in and would then put them, put them on a road to somewhere else. And if that road was impassable, then the port wouldn't do that. But of course, the port is therefore imposing security costs on the um, the town down the road who want who now has to build a bigger wall, for example, a bigger barrier. Uh, potentially you could come up with an argument about, um, what's the word, where you pay off, um, the port would collect money from the, um, from the town down the road instead. Uh, yes. but, um, but that doesn't always work. In fact, um, Nick Jarbo uh, had a debate with, um, had a, had a, wrote a repost to David Friedman about this argument, saying well, that it doesn't take into account um, extortion because sometimes it's easy to generate a massive externality which your neighbour is then forced to pay you to stop um, because the costs to you from generating that, deliberately generating an externality are so low. Uh, as for, um, as for your, for your argument again about, um, well, another, so my, my observation about the private property argument is similar to an observation I have about libertarianism, which is that I find it difficult to distinguish between the idea of a, a private um, property town where the, either the owner of the town or the residents club together in a cooperative manner um, to, uh, to exclude people from their private property, free association and disassociation, as you say, and a um, state which does the same thing. You can conceptualize the state as a very large landlord. Yes, however, I think that um, the individuals who form this private property association are more likely to be of one mind and not very, and geographically not very large. So they can't actually, I mean, people would flow around them rather than into them. Sure. Um, and this, this uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, an argument, a libertarian argument in, in more general terms. Libertarians would say, well, why do we all have to go to the same restaurant and eat the same, th eat the same thing this evening if we don't want to? Why can't we go to different restaurants? Um, and this, you can make the same argument about the state. Why can we have? Why can we split the country into uh, smaller countries? But I think that's a, a whole can of worms. <laughs> Which is perhaps, perhaps beyond the scope of tonight's oh, discussion. Sure. Very topical worms. It might be said that um, the important thing is not political union, but um, free movement of goods. So, well, ma many, many enclaves, for example, Chinatowns in every, in almost every city in the world. Yeah. And then the Jews very much form a community to their, uh, their own within Britain and in the Sadly, they're often obliged to. Uh, well, <laughs> you, know, it's a, you know, the ghetto, of course, was a eulogy on the part of the Jews to begin with. And it turned, flipped over to being a 
what we now think of as ghetto, which is a slum. Yeah. yeah but it was basically a, a snobbish district to begin with. Oh, yeah, the word the, the, the ghetto, pardon? Oh, Venice, wasn't it? Uh, the original ghetto. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, was it Venice? I, I think so. I just read this somewhere. Yeah, I think I haven't, I haven't really addressed your second point at all about people choosing to form intentional communities and choosing to live in, uh, in areas more to their liking. Um, but I think that's because it's sort of orthogonal to everything I've been arguing tonight. I mean, you can have, you can have one or the other, or you can have both, or you can have neither. Uh. So I'm not really sure if, I, if what, I've, what I've been talking about tonight really clashes with that. I mean, as things stand now, in a non-libertarian exactly, world, we have we have yes. a, a state migration policy, yes. and we have people moving to Chinatown, and we have we have Chinatown. Yes. Uh, On the plus side, for instance, and, and um, very um, famously, um, FDR, the great um, great hero of many, uh, would not permit Jewish uh, immigration during the 1930s uh, into America. A very rattling empty place of not as rattling and as empty as Australia. So yeah. everyone that the that the uh, the Nazis regarded as Jewish could have gone to Australia or America, and both America and Australia would have gained as a result. But they didn't permit it; wouldn't allow it. Now that's an exercise in um, what doesn't to sound very really libertarian, but uh, that's an exercise in control of immigrants immigration and immigration, uh, yeah. to be deplored. So, uh, of course you're not saying, you're not disagreeing with that, but the same as happening at the moment, where, where people are fleeing violence. It's true, it's true. Yeah, it's true. We're also, we're also it's bringing true. violence. Yeah, I'm well, going to be, yeah. well, the lady at the back, I'm going to be making a bump. The lady at the back is the next in, in line. Sorry. Yeah, Bevan may well have said that. Friedman also said the same thing. Um, I definitely, I make a distinction between the market and business. So certainly, um, it's it's in the interests of um, business owners to have uh, more migration because more immigration because it does drive down wages. Um, Not just wages, but rates. The way people are treated now, just in my lifetime, I cannot believe. Oh, the sure. Difference in the way um, and in fact, in fact, people, because people are different, if um, to speak in abstract terms, uh, if uh, if one group of people in society have a lower uh, subjective interest rate than another group of people, then eventually um, those people will end up owning most things. And if one group of people are willing to live in um, smaller bedrooms, smaller rooms, then um, then housing costs will per, per square foot will tend to go up. Uh, but of course, it is, it's important to note that um, the welfare state does subsidise immigration for businesses in the sense that the business gets the lower wages um, caused not just by immigration but by the welfare state. Uh, but the externalities of that immigration, if any, um, are not paid by the business. No, no, we, uh, we are subsidising the business Yes, so it's, it's, it's absolutely true that the welfare state does subsidise big business. And the reason they get away with it is because they can bring an end to supply people 
Mike Ashley could not do what he does if he couldn't rely on her endless supply of desperate people who put up anything. Yeah, it's an interesting observation, though, that the, the, um, the fact that welfare states subsidize big business in general, not, not talking about immigration for the time bit for the moment, but just speaking about um, within an existing country, uh, the fact that a welfare state subsidizes business is not an argument necessarily against the welfare state. I mean, there may be arguments against the welfare state, but the fact that businesses benefit uh, is, a, is a side effect. Um, this would be a good time to bring up a thing called the theory of the second best, which states that if you have an economy which is not a purely free market libertarian system but has various governmental controls, then eliminating one of those controls, eliminating those controls one at a time, doesn't necessarily make things better. Uh, so, for example, imagine you have a non-libertarian society with a welfare state and um, immigration controls, and you eliminate the immigration controls, but you don't eliminate the welfare state, then you potentially make things worse. So the theory of the second best says that, uh, that it's, only, uh, it's only going straight to a libertarian society in a big bang, which is guaranteed to make things better from a libertarian point of view. Pat? Yes, sir. I, I, I think that the libertarian position where you want a, a liberty, you're in favour of a limited immigration. No, no, I'm not a libertarian. But I, I, I can't quite understand what you're trying to get over. Um, are you, do you agree with a limited immigration? No, no, I think it's a, I think it's a bad idea because I, what I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to get over is that people have people are different, um, and the concept of of immigration, I think to treat immigration as a single monolithic concept is an error, and that really you should look at immigration on an individual scale, but that libertarianism doesn't do that. Um, it, treats, it treats immigration by one person as exactly the same as immigration by another person, and ignores uh, important differences. I mean, there are many libertarians, for example, who want strict controls on immigration. Against yeah. immigration, but they want it very well controlled, and for a very simple reason, and that is that the people coming in, the anti-libertarians, I'm just giving you an example, yeah. may well be anti-libertarians, and they come in with a simple uh, desire to destroy the libertarian culture. Now, unless you have controls. The culture is not going to survive. Well, I, I absolutely there's, agree with there's that. There's a famous, um, I, I, his name escapes me now, there's a famous libertarian in the United States. Hans Hopper. That's not his name, actually. If you, if you said Hopper, it, I don't remember. Hans Hopper is one such person who would but, argue along those lines. Yeah, and, and, and for that very reason, philosophically, there's, there's nothing wrong with the culture, not from a libertarian perspective. Who has the most babies grow up to be non libertarians should we, should we allow them to emerge from the room, from the womb? Yeah. <laughs> Shove them back That's up. That's an interesting point, but I think that there's... You, you, you have to take into account that there are cultures that want to destroy the idea of liberty and, and, and libertarians. And, and, and that's why you have to have controls. It's as simple as that. But I see this as a, a, a contradiction at the heart of libertarianism in, in that if you're... As, as I understand it, if you agree with immigration controls at all, then you're not a libertarian. No. Um, no. And I, well, I, I'm aware that there are people who call themselves libertarians um, who are in favour of immigration controls, but I, I think they're uh, confused. <laughs> uh, because I suppose it's, it's like saying we must, uh, we must destroy the thing in order to save it. We must uh, impose immigration controls, uh, which is a non-libertarian thing to do, in order to save libertarianism is this not contradictory and the correct response is to say okay we're in favor of uh, in favor of liberty um, but we don't include freedom of movement across borders uh, in that as an absolute good well, I think that's the only way to make it coherent yeah, I mean it's rather like building a castle isn't it? Bob, Bob, Bob described earlier as uh, about being uh, you, you, have the, you have a libertarian right to discriminate as well. Sure. 
Yeah. So this is kind of following on from what you said, and I think also something Bob said, which is this uh, want to let a local community reject it. So that, yeah. And you said that it's isn't that kind of uh, anti libertarian doesn't that contradict the idea of I think it does. So like whether you there is that desire to say that there's certain kinds of people that we don't want in our in my home, in my village, in my town, in my city, in my country. So yeah. where is it where some kind of maybe it's directly slightly a box or where do I'm not not libertarian, so where do libertarians stand on that? So like if, if by principle you believe that someone has a right or there's no no one has a right to reject something yeah. from a piece of land. Well there there's a there's a there are very many different types of, of liberal and libertarian. Um, there are some libertarians who talk about, say, a privately owned town. But in, in that case, it would still be one individual or one company who would make the choice. Uh, as for whether... As in the whole town is owned by one person. Yeah. Or, say, if the whole town were tenants, for example. Okay. Um, as for whether a town could club together um, and make, make choices about who they're going to allow to live there... Um, there are some ways to do this that are compatible with libertarianism. For example, um, where I know you, you all agree to pull your private property and then make some sort of agreement. Like there are apartment blocks in America where there's a, a committee, and if you want to rent an apartment, the rest of the uh, rest of the people living in the building have to agree. Um, but as for whether if that such an agreement doesn't exist, um, libertarianism allows. Um, makes any provision for that. No, it doesn't really. Um, it's, in fact, I, I would put it even strongly, more strongly, I would say that liberalism is the belief that you're not allowed to choose your own neighbours. Um, <laughs> it's quite a controversial statement, but It is, yeah, it's um, false. Thank you. Uh, in that, well, it, it's certainly libertarianism, if your neighbour owns some property, libertarianism or propertarianism, as um, some people uh, call it, um, if your neighbour owns some property and they sell it or rent it to someone you didn't like, you can't do anything about it. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah. Exactly, externalities of any kind, and people are, are just one type of externality, one might say. Um, yeah. That's, so yeah, I'm kind of I'm interested in what because for me that is uh, there's examples of places you said Japan or maybe Scandinavia where they have very homogeneous population, population and people look at them and say, well, even if I am for immigration or for diversity and all that, look how peaceful these countries are. Or yeah. they, they look at the, and I think you mentioned a couple of examples where they, maybe they're easy to govern, maybe they have these positive yeah. things. And people are trying to explain these things by saying, okay, maybe it's social it's kind of cultural thing yeah. and you know whatever. maybe it's genes maybe it's having capital punishment or whatever um, uh, the example you gave I think you can't ig ignore that so no exactly that, that no. is sort of people want to have people a culture has built up maybe a liberal culture or whatever and it's incompatible with people coming from another country and maybe the question is you know in the past this, the few people that came in to America or to Europe were assimilated, and that was okay because the, 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 the culture of that country wasn't affected because there were so few people coming in. So it wasn't a yeah. problem, and, and there's huge amounts of people coming in, maybe it's a problem. I mean, I don't know the answer, I'm just, I'm just saying that. Yeah, these are interesting observations, and this, it would be good to make a distinction between libertarianism and liberalism. Um, and this ties back to what you, we were talking about earlier, or rather I was talking about in response to your question, um, about how, at least with non-doctrinaire liberalism, you're able to, you are able to um, make exceptions to your liberalism to preserve something that you value, like a liberal society or a peaceful society. Uh, or indeed a homogenous society, which, for example, the Japanese seem to value for its own sake. Anyone else? Bob? Uh, it is possible to have 
little, little country. There's no reason why every country can't consist of a great many little countries. Of course, it would simply be a, ge a geographical country. It would not be a political country or a state. Uh, this is rather my, my earlier point. I need to live it later. Um, and I really cannot see, providing that you're feasible, why this, why this cannot ob obtain. Providing nothing is required of you. Uh, for example, the examples of uh, where a homosexual couple come and insist on having a cake made by someone who doesn't want to make them a cake. Uh, I don't think they have any right whatsoever to insist that the cake be made or that, um, or that fines be levied upon the person who wouldn't make it or uh, a Christian couple that don't want a, a, a gay couple. Well, I'm a gay man. I've been for 30 odd years with a gay man. Well, I hope he's another gay man. <laughs> Well, he's been faking it for a long time. But uh, you see the point. Uh, yeah. I, I insist that you should be able to separate or not do it, or do it or not do it. But this can be done from a, a micro level up to a macro level. It doesn't, all that really, the one thing you could ask of uh, one another as regards our um, ideologies is you let people hit the road. You know? Yeah. Don't, don't trap them, don't attack them, say you're no longer welcome, hit the road. Now, so if anyone can go anywhere in the world, and these days you almost can go from anywhere to anywhere, as we're now finding out, providing that was, you, know, you don't say, we don't like you, but we're going to kill you here. Because, <laughs> you know, you're a hand, and it, it's cheaper that way. <laughs> no, if the assistance merely was, you're no longer welcome, please, please disperse. I think the world can, can manage such things. Well, if we're, if we're going to be utopian and we're allowed to imagine future libertarian societies were also, of course, allowed to imagine future geopolitical arrangements, smaller countries, more countries. Uh, there's a, a British philosopher called Nick Land who um, didn't like England, so he left, moved to Shanghai, and he's always writing about um, fission and political structures splitting, and wouldn't it be great if that happened more often? Uh, as for the argument of can you hit the road, um, you can. Uh, to an extent, but I think you may, you exaggerate the ease with which it's possible to move countries for at least two reasons. One, of course, is that immigration controls do exist, and that you can't just move to Switzerland or just move to Australia uh, as easy as you'd like um, anymore. You used to be able to. Um, and the other argument against that is that you may be able to move to Australia or Siberia uh, but it's not very nice in Siberia, and the best land is often already taken, and there's people there already who may not want, want you there. Uh, and indeed the best locations, so there's nothing particularly remarkable about London, but the fact that there's a city there already, uh, all this valuable re real estate and all this valuable capital is there already, means that you might say, if ah, this person's refusing to bake me a cake, I could move to Siberia, or I could try and politically agitate and make them move to Siberia and stay here myself. So there's always going to be uh, an equilibrium where it may be that leaving is the best thing to do for you, or it may be that politically agitating is the cheaper option. Yes. So I heard um, of this possible solution, I'm not sure who, who said it, but this idea that, okay, fine, we, I want to have open immigration. So like, in principle, I think that maybe it doesn't work with the welfare states, it might not work with the numbers and whatever. So I have this idea of, maybe it's kind of a libertarian idea where I'm saying that, you know, if I want to bring, take people from another country and bring them over and sponsor them. Yeah. And then, so that, you know, there's a rule somewhere that you can't really immigrate to a country unless you have a certain amount of money that you can support yourself and your yeah. family. But if someone wants to sponsor you, for example, to let you in, is that, is that something you've heard? It's Harper type thing. Sorry? Harper go talking about this sort of thing. Okay. And it's Harper who we mentioned earlier on. And indeed, I think Britain has something similar, or at least did until maybe recently. Um, yeah, some sort of immigration bonds. Oh, yes, yeah, um, so Where either someone could sponsor you or you could sponsor yourself. Yes. Um, I understand that Australia, if you want to move there permanently, you need to have a certain amount of money. 
Um, Malta, until recently, used to sell citizenship. Um, How does that work out then? Uh, the EU told them to stop because yeah. it was half a million euros for an EU passport because, of course, a Maltese passport lets you live oh, anywhere. Oh, you didn't have to live in Maltese? No. Ah. <laughs> no. You could live anywhere you liked in the European Union and yeah. they got told to stop. Um, what you said briefly about the uh, welfare state reminded me that, of course, it would be possible to have a citizens-only welfare state. To a certain extent, Britain does this. It's, it's, you have to have worked here for, if you're a European migrant, you have to have worked here for a few years before you can start claiming um, some benefits. But in principle, it would be possible to restrict uh, the welfare state to citizens, in which case that would reduce the incentive for immigration, but it wouldn't eliminate it entirely if you were still granting citizenship to uh, new immigrants or to their children. For example, in America, uh, you might move there on a temporary work permit, but if you have children there, uh, in America, they become citizens. Anchor babies. Anchor babies, yes. It's a bizarre, uh, bizarre idea. Yeah. They actually, they were kind of proud of that at one point. Now it's uh... In the, well, when it was, when it was created, I understand it's a constitutional amendment that dates from the 60s, maybe not. Of course, the welfare state, of course. Only dates it, from the 40s. Well, no, no, <laughs> well, the welfare state's got nothing to do with about it. Nothing whatsoever. To do with what? The welfare state is nothing to do with libertarianism. Libertarianism no, 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 no. is dedicated to destroying the welfare state. Yes, this is true. Including the National Health Service. I'm interested, okay, so have you studied many countries that had mass immigration that you would say benefited from it, benefited from it and didn't exhibit some of the problems that you mentioned about cultural problems and all those other things? I am not aware of any. But I would be very interested if there were to hear about them. Australia had, you know, huge amounts of immigration recently. Uh, oh, I was unaware of that. Um, to the point where the composition of the country has changed quite a lot. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to see, see all the consequences of that. Because they had the point system, but actually they had, they had more immigration after the point system initially. And and we don't hear yeah we don't hear horror stories from Australia. Yeah. Um, I will I will investigate. Any other speakers? Oh, thank you very much indeed.